It should go without saying that Concordance is one of the most erudite, rational, and well-spoken people on YouTube. His criticisms of homeopathy, alternative medicine, and anti-vaccination conspiracies make his some of the best videos around. When I find myself in disagreement with him, I reevaluate my own position very carefully. That occurred when he made his recent video on the role of faith and doubt in the mind of the religious believer. He used the story of Abraham and Isaac as an exemplar, condemning the story as a horrific triumph of religious certitude over rational doubt. Concordance said it was his least favorite Bible story and that he would actually remove it from the Bible if he could. This caught my attention because the story of Abraham and Isaac is actually one of my favorite stories in the Bible. As I said, I'm apprehensive about contradicting Concordance here, but I think there's a profound irony in dogmatically criticizing the story of Abraham and Isaac as an endorsement of dogmatism. Personally, I read the story another way. I'm not saying that my reading of the story is right and concordances is wrong. Like all good stories, there are a variety of competing interpretations, and we each have to decide for ourselves which are the ones that have the most value to us as individuals. Rather, I want to propose this as an opportunity for concordance and others like him to take a look at that story from another perspective and maybe see something of value that, in their haste, they might have missed. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I think Abraham's actions are abominable. But so are the actions of Marlowe's Dr. Faust, Shakespeare's Shylock, and Sophocles' King Creon. These characters, like Abraham, illuminate the human condition not only in spite of their deep moral failings, but because of them. We can learn a lot about ourselves by studying these stories, but only if we're willing to see past our own judgmental blindness. My reading of the story of Abraham and Isaac largely follows from Soren Kierkegaard's book, Fear and Trembling. This is an amazing examination of religious psychology, and it's one of the foundational works of existentialism. Part of what I find so fascinating about Kierkegaard's take on the tale is that he looks at this 4,000-year-old story and sees it in a way that no one else before him had ever seen it. Despite the fact that billions of people had read it before him, despite an entrenched religious tradition, that told him how he was supposed to read the story, Kierkegaard somehow managed to look at it through new eyes. It says quite a lot about the power of the interpretive mind, the nature of hermeneutics, as well as the complexity of the story of Abraham and Isaac and its themes. So what does the story look like through Kierkegaard's eyes? Well, contrary to Concordance's take, Kierkegaard doesn't think Abraham has certainty at all. Quite the opposite, in fact. Abraham is racked with doubt. If you were just a blind follower, someone who automatically did whatever God told him to do, then he would have no humanity in him at all. And it can be tempting to view him this way, so that way we can distance ourselves from him. If Abraham's just an inhuman monster, then we can cast stones at him without having to reflect on what it is that we have in common with him. But to do so is to ignore the fact that Abraham clearly loves his son, Isaac, very much, and is horrified by the thought of killing him. He has to walk for three and a half days across the desert, wrestling with that fear, with the uncertainty, the horrible, painful doubt deep in his heart. He has not simply accepted, blindly, thoughtlessly, without question, God's command. It's the very fact that he's so filled with uncertainty that makes this story so compelling. All of this pain, all of this doubt is essential and all too often glossed over when reading the story. It's in overcoming that doubt, the decision to act in the face of uncertainty, that makes Abraham all too human. It's only when Abraham has worked his way through that fear that he's ready to make what Kierkegaard calls the leap of faith. Kierkegaard coined that now famous phrase. Well, strictly speaking, actually, the original phrase was the leap to faith, but it was, I guess, mistranslated in the first English version, and that mistake has proven kind of resilient. Now, skeptics are often critical of the idea of the leap of faith, often because they presume, like concordance, that the leap of faith is simply a matter of blind obedience, thoughtless confidence that God will take care of his true believers. But that's not what Kierkegaard means at all. 
In fact, Kierkegaard was viciously critical of his fellow Christians for thinking of faith as automatic, as an entitlement, as a selfish comfort, something that they liked just because it made their lives happier. He actually joined the Atheist League to protest their complacency. He thought they loved God simply because of what God did for them, rather than for what God required of them. Faith was not a comfort for Abraham. It was a horrible burden. It would have been much easier on him if he could have just abandoned his faith, abandoned his doubt, and accept solace in the certainty that he was doing the right thing by not killing his son. Hmm, doesn't that certainty feel good? Faith is not so much about belief for Kierkegaard, so much as it's about commitment. And doubt is an essential ingredient in a real, genuine commitment. If there were no doubt, it wouldn't be a leap. It would simply be a walk in the park, as it were. It requires nothing of you to act upon certainty. No struggle, no risk, no sacrifice. A leap, by contrast, is an act of courage. You have no reason to think God will catch you. God might not even exist, Kierkegaard says. And even if he does, he might choose to not save you. Yet in spite of this uncertainty, you take the leap anyway. That requires tremendous courage. The willingness to sacrifice your own soul because you've committed yourself to something greater than your own selfish, petty desire for comfort, for distraction, for certainty. Again, I don't want you to misunderstand what I find attractive here. I condemn Abraham and disagree with Kierkegaard's praise of him as a knight of faith. I don't know how anyone, like, say, Jesus Freak, for example, can admire Abraham without also admiring Andrea Yates, who drowned her five children in a bathtub in 2001 because she thought God commanded her to. The value of the story for me is not as religious instruction, but rather as existential allegory. And I'm hardly the first atheist to value it in that way. Both Friedrich Nietzsche and Jean-Paul Sartre were deeply influenced by Kierkegaard's fear and trembling. Because the story of Abraham and Isaac is not simply a story about a man doing what he's been told to do. Rather, it's very much a story about the virtue of doubt. The doubt that we all have about our lives. How can we find meaning and purpose in this brief, ephemeral existence, given that sooner or later, everything that we do will be undone by the endless march of time. Given the incredible size and scope of the universe, isn't it hubristic to suggest that our existence has any more significance than that of an ant whose death goes unnoticed by all while the stars spin indifferently onward? How can we commit ourselves to living a life that will ultimately amount to nothing. We don't like to acknowledge these doubts. We hide from them. We pursue distractions so we don't have to think about them. But sooner or later, each of us has to face up to that existentialist dread, that uncertainty that our lives might not mean anything at all. If we don't deal with it now, and indeed every day of our lives, we'll find ourselves like Ivan Ilyich in Tolstoy's story dying without the slightest idea of what we've actually been living for. Death is far too important to be left to the end of life because, well, let's face it, we're all incurable. We all have to take that leap of faith in Kierkegaard's sense of the term. We have to decide to commit ourselves to something greater than ourselves, not in the absence of doubt, but rather because of it, because we can't be certain that it means anything that will ultimately make any real difference at all. That decision takes courage, it takes effort, and it takes sacrifice. The story of Abraham is a metaphor for that existential decision. A decision in the face of doubt and fear and uncertainty, but a decision that is ultimately the only way we can create a life of any significance. There's a lesson there for all human beings, even atheists. Provided, of course, we can see past our own knee-jerk indictment of the messenger.